Okay, welcome to our fourth and final debate of the evening, our candidates for Lieutenant Governor. Steve Kerrigan has served the Commonwealth for more than 20 years as an elected leader in his hometown of Lancaster. An aide to U.S. Senator Edward M. Kennedy, Mayor Thomas M. Menino, and Attorney General Tom Riley, and served senior roles for President Barack Obama, heading the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte and the presidential inaugurals in 2009 and 2013. He now serves as president of Massachusetts Military Heroes Fund, a nonprofit that supports families of fallen heroes. Karen Polito is the Republican candidate for lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. Karen is a former member of the Shrewsbury Board of Selectmen, a former state representative of the 11th Worcester District representing Shrewsbury and Westboro, and a small business owner. Karen is a lifelong resident of Shrewsbury, where she is raising her two children with her husband, Steve Rodolakis. We'll begin with our opening statements. We had our coin toss, and Mr. Kerrigan will go first. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you all for uh, for gathering here this evening and sticking it out for the for the last of uh, of these uh, forums. So I, I do appreciate it. Uh, you know, we've been we've been waiting. I've been campaigning for a little over a year and a half now, uh, and uh, right after I became the Democratic nominee uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I challenged uh, Karen to a series of six regional debates across the Commonwealth. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, for the fact that uh, we're on the stage together uh, this evening because I think the. The voters of the Commonwealth deserve a good opportunity to hear uh, what both of us have to offer uh, the Commonwealth and the job of the next lieutenant governor. So uh, I'm glad you're here. I would love to see you at least five or six more times around the Commonwealth in the next 27 days. Hopefully we'll strike a deal in the next 25 It'll minutes. Be like 20 or 30 more times than somewhere along the way. <laughs> God willing. Uh, I am, uh, I'm glad to be here. You know, look, I'm running for lieutenant governor because uh, I want to get government back in the business of solving problems. I've spent my life in public service. I was. Uh, born right here in the city of Worcester, and uh, <clears throat> against my will, uh, three days later, I was wrested from the great city of Worcester at Hanneman Hospital and brought to Lancaster, Mass., where I, I was born and raised uh, with my, uh, my family. Uh, you know, I, I've had a chance to see government do great things in people's lives. Uh, my old boss, Senator Kennedy, used to always say, an awful lot of great things can get done if no one cares who gets the credit. Uh, we've got to get government back in the business of solving problems. We've got to give you, all of you, a government that's worthy of the sacrifices you make. People want government to do what it says it's going to do. Uh, we've gotten away from that. Uh, you know, the mayor brought up a little earlier the, the corruption and lack of trust that exists. We've been talking about this for the entire campaign. That we've got to get people believing in government again. Because I know that we, you know, throughout my career, I've worked with the private sector, with the nonprofit world, uh, and with government leaders at all levels. Uh, to solve people's problems, you know, be it investing in schools and early childhood education, uh, investing in regional economies, investing in our people. Uh, that's who Martha Coakley and I believe in uh, and believe are the best uh, hope for our future are the people of Massachusetts. I look forward to serving as your lieutenant governor uh, come January, and thank you very much for having me here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Kerrigan. Ms. Polito. I just want to say thank you very much for coming tonight. It is a great privilege for me to be in my hometown area. This is where my family began its history here in Worcester when my great-grandfather came to this country from Sicily, began his business, a business that I own and operate today. And I'm very proud to be here with the Chamber of Commerce, with the realtors and the property owners, as I have an interest in all of those areas. Uh, certainly for me, as I come to this forum tonight, I think about those that served from this area before. And I come here and to just say how excited I would be to continue the voice that people like Paul Salucci, who is here in my heart, although is not physically with me in this campaign, he mentored me through all of my public life. Someone like Paul Salucci and Tim Murray, who always gave the Worcester area a strong voice. And in my own service, having started as a selectman in my hometown, wanting to come back to an area that was so good to my family, where my roots are planted, to just give back and to be elected five times to the state legislature, serving as a member of the regional caucus here, we worked hard with 
my friends like Representative Pedoni, who no longer serves, across party lines as a caucus to really make sure that the needs of our area were met then, and what a privilege it would be, be for me to continue along those lines. I am running with Charlie Baker. We are a formidable team having public experience, private experience. We have been laying out our plans and our positive vision for our Commonwealth, many of those issues that we'll touch upon tonight. Elections matter, experience matters, and I am asking for your vote. Four weeks from today, it will be all over, and I hope that I am your Lieutenant Governor and Charlie Baker is your Governor. Thank you. The first uh, set of questions are broad questions, and we'll give the candidates two minutes to respond. The first question goes to Ms. Polito. It's about affordable housing. Most housing authorities across the state have very lengthy waiting lists. In Worcester, the Housing Authority has more than 12,000 applicants, many of them homeless, and some who have been on the waiting list for more than a decade. What would you do to reduce the backlog and help those families find housing? Well, I just want to thank you, Mr. Moderator, for serving on as in that role tonight, but you also serve in a very different role, which is as the Director of Worcester Housing Authority. And recently I read about a program that you started there, and I called you and asked if I could come to the Worcester Housing Authority and meet with you, and you were very generous to allow me to meet with your staff and for Charlie and I to meet with residents of the Worcester Housing Authority. With 12,000 people waiting, these are people that are in poverty, that have very difficult circumstances. We cannot allow five generations of family to be growing in Worcester Housing. And this man right here, Ray Mariano, has started a plan called the A Better Life Program. He gave me this badge. It's called a champion. I I stand with Ray Mariano as a champion for every resident of Worcester Housing Authority to have a path to a better life. This is a program that will require that you learn how to save your money, pay your bills, get your GED, and learn how to work. This is what brought my family to this country, and this is the spirit that Ray Mariano and myself as a champion and Charlie Baker embrace, and we want to see that program adopted not only here in Worcester, but across the board. Charlie Baker and I have a lot of plans to help people in public housing find a way out. We first and foremost want to make sure that the public housing that we have is available for legal residents and for veterans, and we want to make it truly a transitional experience so that people can earn their way and be successful and be proud of their achievements in life. And we will certainly make that a goal of our administration, working with partners like Ray Mariano and others in Worcester Housing Authority to replicate the success that they are achieving there every day. Thank you. Mr. Kerrigan, same question. Two minutes. Two sure. Minutes. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, this is, um, this is an issue that directly addresses you every day, but it, direct, it addresses all of us uh, and impacts all of us every day. Um, you know, from, we look at housing uh, from the issue of homelessness all the way to home ownership, and, and we believe that a state policy on housing has to be that comprehensive. We have to find ways uh, to get folks out of homelessness. We've got to address the issue of chronic homelessness and families who are living in, in homelessness and in our shelters. We've got to double the number of vouchers that are available so that folks can get into housing and get off the streets. We've got to stop the program uh, or at least stem the tide of the program that's putting uh, families in hotels and motels. Uh, and we, I look at it as sort of an accordion of housing options and we've got to expand that so that we can get folks off the waiting list and into affordable housing and yes, get folks out of affordable housing uh, and into market rate units and, in, and then get folks who are in market rate units who are getting a chance under uh, a Coakley Kerrigan administration to get more skills and to get more opportunities and to grow their, their own personal economies uh, and get a job to then move on to home ownership. We believe it's got to be a holistic approach that goes all the way from homelessness to home ownership. Uh, we're committed to doing that. We want to work with uh, great champions like yourself um, uh, on issues of, of affordable housing because some of the things you've done have been really remarkable and as has been done across the Commonwealth with, by the way, very few uh, resources and, and sometimes not a lot of support. Uh, but you know as well as I do as a former mayor and as a former selectman from, from Worcester County, 
uh, and someone who worked with you when I worked in the federal government. You know, we need partners at all levels of government. We need the business community and we need the nonprofit world working together uh, to solve these problems. That's the only way we're going to do it. That's what I've done my entire career. That's what Martha Coakley's done her entire career. And that's what we'll do as governor and lieutenant governor. Thank you, Mr. Kerrigan. The next question is on economic development. Goes to Mr. Kerrigan. What specific plans would you propose or support to spur economic growth in greater Worcester? So I, I appreciate the question. We actually, um, we talk about this a lot. You know, I, I, being from Worcester County, uh, wait, by the way, we're incredibly lucky, and I'll, I'll say this uh, for Karen as well, um, we're incredibly lucky that Worcester County is going to have a lieutenant governor uh, from Worcester County. So isn't that great? We should give Worcester County a round of applause for that. But um, uh, I certainly hope it's me. I just want to be very clear on that. I would like it to be me. Um, you know, Martha and I believe uh, in an economy that's not just focused around 128 and inside of, inside of Boston. And being raised uh, in North Worcester County, uh, Martha was raised in the Berkshires, we understand that um, economies outside of Boston have, play a critical role to our economic future. That's why we've unveiled a plan to invest uh, half a billion dollars over the next 10 years, 400 million of it in infrastructure programs, and t uh, 100 million dollars of it in grants uh, that'll go to 16 different economic regions all across the Commonwealth to allow them to prioritize prioritize their programs, uh, to invest in the way that the community wants to. Rather than having Boston and Beacon Hill dictating how you're going to spend it, where you're going to spend it, when you're going to spend it, uh, give more uh, regional authority uh, to the economic regions all across the Commonwealth. That's what's important. We're also going to grow our economy uh, from cradle to career by starting to invest in our kids in early childhood education. There are 17,000 kids right now, low-income children, who are on a waiting list uh, to get access to early childhood education. Uh, Charlie Baker um, and Karen Polito do not believe that early childhood education is the right tool uh, to move our, our ch kids uh, into our school system and give them a better opportunity to grow. We believe we've got to start there. Every, every uh, study will show you. Kids who have access to early childhood education end up through life earning more, learning more, higher home ownership rates, by the way, lower foreclosure rates, by the way, uh, lower crime rates, um, again, higher earning. And that opportunity, that investment in those kids will create an opportunity from cradle to career where we'll provide more affordable uh, public, hi public higher education and investment in our community. So we've got to look at it across the board. Uh, that's the approach we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerrigan. Ms. Polito, same question. Yes, on the question of economic development before that, on the issue of early education, Charlie Baker and I obviously do support a good, strong start for all of our children across the, across the Commonwealth, but we disagree with the, our opponents who believe in a one-size-fits-all approach, and we have a much more strategic approach to that. Having said that, economic development. You've heard a lot of politicians talk about it, but let me just tell you what our specific plan is. And Charlie Baker and I haven't just made this up this final month. It's been something that we've been talking about over the course of this year. First of all, we have got to get this economy moving again in Massachusetts. That means you have to send a signal to the business community that we will hold the line on taxes. We will get our state government functioning again and hold the system accountable to get results and to look at the regulatory structure and reduce the barriers in terms of uh, growth for businesses across the board. As a small business owner, there's a whole lot that we can do to help small businesses incubate and grow in this commonwealth. Having said that, the question is re in reference to Worcester, the Worcester area. Having grown up here and having served on the Chambers of Commerce both in Worcester and in the Corridor 9 area, I know firsthand, working with local officials, working with Tim Murray, who is the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the things that we've been successful at, like I voted to support the courthouse downtown Main Street, like reorganizing CSX so we have commuter rail, like making sure that Kevin O'Sullivan's MBI incubator is funded in the legislature, and I over, did override Romney to get that money back to Worcester. But what's the next step? Turning around our auditorium, perhaps making it an, an art center, reforming the old courthouse, using the Brownfields legislation to look at that Route 20 corridor to make pad-ready sites making maybe express trains a possibility for Worcester. How exciting would that be? And certainly continuing the success at our Worcester airport and making JetBlue even more successful every day here in central Massachusetts. Thank you. The next round of questions will give you each a one minute response. These are property and property owner related questions. The first one goes to Ms. Polito. Massachusetts is the only state or one of the only states in the country that requires landlords and property managers to wait 30 days to assess late fees. House Bill 1670 would allow a late fee to be assessed after 10 days. 
Do you support this bill? Why or why not? I, I think this issue obviously pertains to property owners. I mean, I'm a commercial property owner. I understand the value of having rent paid on time and the bills that a business owner has to pay. In the area of rental property for tenants here in Worcester, this is obviously an issue of great concern. And you need to balance the rights of a property owner have, who has to meet their obligations to maintain the property and pay their bills to the city of Worcester with the tenant who might be struggling with paycheck to paycheck to pay, make their their payments to the to the landowner. But we've got to balance this. We've got to put it into a fair situation, certainly as Massachusetts is an outlier. Some other states do allow the imposition of fees after 10 days. Some also allow the, the agreement between the parties to rank. But let's have that conversation. Let's make sure that the property owners and the tenant organizations have a seat at our table and that we resolve this issue. Sometimes you need balance on Beacon Hill and checks and balances in the system to make sure this stuff gets done. And that's exactly what Charlie Baker and I will bring to state government in what is sorely needed today. Mr. Kerrigan? I won't say this often, probably, uh, but for the most part, I agree with Karen. Uh, you know, this is, um, there has to be a balanced approach because there are needs for uh, those who own uh, properties, you know, may not be uh, large uh, properties, but they have a mortgage to pay nonetheless, and they need their tenant to pay their, their rent on time. And so there does have to be a balance between that and making sure that we're not uh, burdening that person who is working paycheck to paycheck. I will, I will just say, though, I'll take the opportunity to take, you know, uh, Karen did point out that we need to get our economy moving again. Uh, first of all, we've, we've gotten it moving. We're working hard at it. Massachusetts uh, has come out of the recession quicker than other places. There are still a lot of jobs that need to be filled here. Uh, Worcester Voc Tech has done an amazing job of making sure we're training people for the skill sets that are out there and the jobs that are available. Uh, but under this divided leadership that she referenced, uh, when we had 16 years of Republican governors, we ended up 47th in the nation in job growth. Governor Patrick has taken us out of the worst recession since the Great Depression and made us, at a, we have a 25 year high in job growth. It's not enough and we've got to keep growing, uh, but getting our economy moving again is exactly what Democrats have been doing since they took the corner office and that's what we'll do under Martha Coakley. I'm going to change this up just a little bit. We, we're doing property owner related questions, but I've got a couple of questions here from property owners which I think are pretty interesting. So I'm going to change it up just a little bit. Mr. Kerrigan, this question goes to you. Explain why we need a lieutenant governor. <laughs> I've never had that question asked of me. That's so strange. <laughs> I've been asked by that, that guy about nine times, I think. Um, you know, during the, the primary campaign, I had a chance, uh, as I am during the general election, but to travel the entire Commonwealth. And I've been, uh, in the primary, I was endorsed by 17 mayors all across, uh, in big cities and small. Uh, and uh, local elected officials, selectmen, school committee members, uh, those folks miss having that access. And I'll tell you, uh, and having someone to call. Tim Murray, uh, who I've known for a great many years, as I know Karen has, uh, was a great resource for people. Uh, for mayors and local elected officials. I run a small nonprofit called the Mass Military Heroes Fund that supports families of fallen service members from Iraq or Afghanistan who were lost over there. Uh, Tim Murray, in the role of Lieutenant Governor and, and working on veterans issues, was our go-to person uh, when we needed to facilitate uh, some successes for families or some, some move things through state government. He did a tremendous job for us in that role. I, we do need a Lieutenant Governor because they play a valuable role in the administration. And the most important thing to consider about the question is that we are a Electing one. One of the two of us uh, will become Lieutenant Governor in January, and we need to make sure that as a Commonwealth, we elect the right person as Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Same question, Ms. Polito. Actually, over the past 14 years, the job growth in Massachusetts has been about 1%. At the national level, it's been 5%. In a Massachusetts, with the universities and the college system that we have, we should be killing it on all levels. There should be jobs everywhere in this state. Our unemployment should be very low. You need two people, Charlie Baker and myself, who are ready on day one to get to work. We are a formidable team. We have known each other. We are friends. We have a common vision and a common energy to get going with this state. First of all, we both have connections to the business community. Charlie on the larger business side, having turned around Harvard Pilgrim from failure to number one. Myself, a small business owner. Both of us served at Selectman, and both of us have served in state government in the legislative branch and in the executive branch. We know on day one what we need to do. We will roll up our sleeves, and we will get to work. That is a unique and valuable asset, much like Will Paul Salucci and Bill Weld brought to you and that we will continue that kind of leadership Time. for Massachusetts. All right, thank you. Another question from the audience. This one goes, starts with Ms. Polito. When will you remove the tolls 
on the Mass Pike. <laughs> I'm glad that started with her. <laughs> well, I know, let me just talk, talk about it in terms of a lot of issues. I mean, I, I am not a, obviously a big fan of tolls and taxes, so you can see that the idea of maintaining our roads is very important, and, and certainly Charlie and I have a plan to do that. It was promised that we would remove the tolls. Bill Weld was the one that started that process in removing the Western tolls, and we will have to have further conversation about that. Let me just relate this to the gas tax. Question one on the ballot is a question that involves not only the increase, it's the inflator on the gas tax. It's a three, three percent, three cent increase in the gas. That does not change. That goes to fund roads and bridges in the state. It's the inflator that Charlie Baker and I are opposed to. We would invite you to join us in opposing the inflator and voting yes on question one to repeal that. Charlie Baker and I have a plan to invest in through the operating budget monies every year to invest in our roads and bridges Time. to maintain them, and we are committed to doing that. Thank you. Mr. Kerrigan, same question. So I, I hate to keep revisiting the, the previous questions, but she mentioned 14 years uh, the job growth has been, was slower than necessary. The first six years of that were under Governor Romney. Uh, and, and, by the way, Governor Swift. Uh, so uh, I will cede that. They did not do a very good job of growing jobs in Massachusetts. And then the first couple of years of Governor Patrick's administration, we had the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression. Since then, we have become, uh, uh, we have a, had a 25-year high in job growth. But I'm glad we brought up transportation because Charlie Baker had a chance when he was ANF secretary, uh, when he designed the Big Dig financing plan that left our Commonwealth with a $1 billion annual shortfall in transportation funding. He designed a fundraising, a finance plan that none of you would do with your home budget or your business, uh, where until the legislature acted last year, for every dollar we paid a T employee, it cost us $1.75 because, because he put it on our bonding authority and not in our operating budget. Uh, that for me is not the kind of leadership that I want in the corner office. We need someone who's investing in our roads and bridges to make sure that eventually we can uh, answer that call to take that down. Thank you. The last section, we'll have a minute and a half responses from each of the candidates. First question goes to Mr. Kerrigan. There have been several tragic examples of failure by the Department of Children and Families, DCF. What needs to be done to ensure that this agency operates effectively and that vulnerable children are protected? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you described it, it's tragic. Um, it's a terrible thing to happen. None of us want to see the most vulnerable among us um, uh, left in such a condition. And that's what government's here for, right? We're supposed to provide uh, for protections for the most vulnerable among us, for those who need our support in our commonwealth. Uh, this, uh, no, there's no doubt that what happened is a tragedy and that we need to invest in DCF. Make sure that we are running a more efficient and effective government. For the entire campaign, I have talked about finding ways to make our government more efficient and effective so we can put those resources toward our social safety net, toward programs like that. But, you know, last week, um, the National Republicans issued a Super PAC ad against uh, my, my running mate, Martha Coakley, attacking her on her record on child protection, which I found disgusting um, uh, and offensive. Uh, Charlie Baker then said that he was proud of his record at HHS as the secretary there. Uh, we looked into that record, and under him as secretary, uh, we had re record high case numbers. He had a report of 273 pages put on his desk two weeks after he became secretary, and in answer to that, uh, the legislature gave more money to him, and what did he do to fulfill a campaign promise that Governor Weld had made? He returned two million dollars to the legislature, to the general fund, to make it look like they were giving back money and getting a tax cut, rather than taking that money. Right now, there was one candidate running for governor right now who had a chance and the resources and the authority in government to protect those kids back in the 1990s, and that's Charlie Baker, and he chose instead to return that $2 million to the general Time. fund, uh, and uh, I believe that was the wrong choice. That's one of the, big, Ms. Polito. That's one of the big differences between uh, my opponent and where we are. They are focused on 20 years ago. We need to focus on today. Now, four years ago, there was a lawsuit filed against Massachusetts by the Children's Rights Children's Rights Group. And they filed that because Massachusetts was the fourth worst in the country for the maltreatment of children in the foster care system. These kids are, were abused, they were hurt, they were set back. I have read that brief. If you've read about these children, you will see how harmful 
their, the situations were that they were in, and we need to fix that. So we have said that lawsuit needs to be settled, not litigated. We need to make sure that there is proper management of our, of our Department of Children and Families so that we get this right. It is not acceptable to any one of us that Jeremiah Oliver fell through the cracks. He went missing, and he is, he is, he is dead because of the failure of our system. This is something that can be managed. Charlie Baker is the only one that proposed a plan in January. When hearing of this, he said we need a regional plan, a regional audit. We need to know what the data says. We need to drill down deep and provide the resources to this the social workers to get this job done. There is no pointing the finger. There is only getting the job done for our kids. And in fact, the independent group that DeVal Patrick called in to help us this year is the same group that gave Charlie Baker an award for the time. work that he did during the Weldon Salucci administration. Time. Okay. Uh, timekeeper, we're going to change these last two questions to one minute only. All right? So we stay within the time limit. We'll go to Ms. Polito with the next question. Last year, the legislature passed and the governor signed a welfare reform bill. Are there additional steps that should be taken to protect against fraud and abuse of public benefits? Well, first of all, let me uh, <laughs> certainly say that that is an example with the legislature working with the executive branch in a bipartisan manner to get something done that had to get done. The welfare reform bill was a good step in the right direction, certainly putting a bureau in place with audits that need to be done on a regular basis to remove the waste and the fraud and the abuse from our our. Uh, public system. That money needs to be used for the safety net. We need to make sure that our safety net works for the most vulnerable people in our state. And when we have people cheating it and abusing it, it takes away from that obligation that we have. In addition to the fact, uh, building on what Ray Mariano started here in Worcester, we need to help people get on their feet and make sure that the public system is not a permanent end for them, that it is truly transitional so that they can get the support through education, learning how to work, and get on their feet so that they can step out of the system in a much more flexible way than exists today. Right now, it's either all in Time. or out, all out, and we want to help people get on their feet and transition out to a better life. Mr. Kerrigan, same question. Uh, well, first, Martha Coakley actually did have a plan uh, that she announced uh, in January as well, before Charlie's did, uh, about creating a, a child protection bureau within DCF that focuses just on children. But on the issue uh, that we're talking about, the, the best social program, the best welfare program for anyone is a job. And we have to work hard, yes, to make sure we run a more efficient and effective government, to make sure that we that folks aren't abusing the system. Absolutely. And we've been talking about uh, this for the entire campaign. Uh, and I welcome a debate uh, on that issue uh, if you'd be willing to do it. Um, and that's an, a critically important thing. But getting folks back to work and making sure we provide uh, better education, better access to training dollars, making sure that, that regional economic opportunities are there and people have a chance to grow their own economy and their own family's economy. Uh, that's the most important thing so that they can have the pride of having a job uh, and going to work each and every day and providing for their family. That's what this is about. We have absolutely have to run a government that people can be proud of and that is worthy of the sacrifices all of you make each and every day. But we have to absolutely 1,000% focus on getting people back to work. Thank you. Final question, Mr. Kerrigan. And then Ms. Polito. Mr. Kerrigan, tell me an idea proposed by your opponent that you would consider adopting if you get elected. I honestly haven't heard many um, that, I would, uh, that I would adopt. Um, you know, our focus in this campaign is focused on making sure uh, that we provide opportunity. Uh, as I said earlier, from cradle to career. Uh, you know, Karen alluded earlier that uh, Charlie, of course, supports kids, but he has said many times that he does not believe that early childhood education, uh, that is the best pathway to our future and to improving people's lives, uh, is an opportunity. They also are against earned sick time uh, and making sure that we don't give, there are one million people, one million people in Massachusetts who woke up this morning without one minute of earned sick time. Uh, and I think that's a travesty for families who have six, sick kids who have to make difficult choices about what to do because their kids aren't in early childhood education and they've got to make a decision when their child is sick or when a loved one is sick. Uh, I believe that our Commonwealth has to stand up for those uh, of us who need that help. That's who we are. We're a Commonwealth. 
We support each other, and together through that, we create economic opportunity and the skills and the workers uh, to, to fulfill that and to really make Massachusetts shine. Time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Ms. Polito? Well, I do look forward to the next two debates that we already have scheduled so that I can highlight the, the details of the plans that we've been talking about over the course of the year. But there is one thing that you did say recently that I thought was really good, and it's your pledge to tackle the issue of violence against women on college campuses and universities. Universities. That is an issue that has, is obviously something we have to pay a lot of attention to with the many college students we have here in Worcester and myself having a passion for victims' rights and advocating for children and being the lead sponsor of Jessica's Law in the, in the legislature. There is no shortage of energy and commitment to advancing women and obviously children with better protection in their lives. So I applaud you for wanting to tackle that on, and I also agree that we need to do more in that area. Well, I think you'll all agree with me that we have two outstanding candidates for Lieutenant Governor. How about a nice round of applause? Thank you, Mayor.